Good evening, everyone. My name is Josh McMullen, and uh, we're going to go ahead and continue in our series tonight, Making My Life Count. In fact, this is the last installment of that series, and we're going to be talking about the secret of Christian contentment, the secret of Christian contentment, and that, that idea, that, that phrase really comes from the book of Philippians, the letter that Paul, the Apostle Paul, uh, that Pastor Parker spoke about last week, that he writes to the church in Philippi. And this is what he says, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Now that's a pretty amazing statement just by itself. But it's even more amazing when we realize that Paul is actually writing this letter from a prison cell. He's been arrested by the Roman government. He's been imprisoned for his faith. Um, if you don't know anything about Roman prisons, why would you know anything about Roman prisons? Um, uh, so, but you actually have to provide your own food and, and clothing in, in a Roman prison. You know, those things aren't provided. They do provide the guards, though, so that's nice. Uh, you have round-the-clock guards, these kind of well-trained Roman guards, and this is Paul's situation. He's stuck in this cell, and he writes these words. I have learned the secret of contentment. It's pretty amazing to write that in that situation. In fact, this letter to the Philippians is actually, part of it is thanking the Philippians for sending him food and clothing, which they had done. And so he writes to them, and he writes this whole letter to the church in Philippi. This is why we call it Philippians. And it's all about joy and rejoicing. And you may know that one of our core values here at Vineyard is choosing joy. It's one of our core values, to choose joy. And Paul is a great example of this. We can learn a lot from him and his example about choosing joy. Now, before we jump in to talk about how to choose joy, I think it's important for us to look at some sources of discontent, right? Paul says he's discovered the secret, he's learned the secret, and that should be encouraging to us, right? Because if, if it, can, it means it can be learned. If Paul learned it, then we can learn it as well. But one of the things that we need to think about when we talk about contentment are sources of discontentment. Sources of discontentment. And this is actually the first uh, bullet or, or kind of fill in the blank on your program is a source of discontent in our lives are counterfeits. In fact, the primary source of discontent in our lives, according to the Bible, are counterfeit joys. Well, what are counterfeits? What are counterfeit joys? Counterfeit joys are, are, are any time that we expect uh, something or somebody, a person or a possession, to bring us ultimate joy when that can only be done by God. That's a counterfeit. That's a counterfeit. The Bible actually refers to these things as idols or false gods, idols or false gods. And we even see that here in the book of Philippians. Paul is talking about what he calls enemies of the cross. And when he goes to describe those enemies of the cross, this is what he says. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. They have a narrow vision about what is actually going to bring them contentment in this life. And in fact, what he says is that their God is their appetite. Appetite for what? What could be an appetite for all kinds of things? Money, power, sex. It doesn't matter, right? The idea here is that he says these enemies of the cross, they believe, they think, they fooled themselves into believing that they will find ultimate joy in these things. And because of that, it has become their God. It has become their idol. But what does he say about the Christian, though? What about the Christian, not the enemy of the, of the cross? He says, but we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly awaiting, or we are eagerly, eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. This is what Paul knows will bring lasting joy. Not counterfeit joys, but true, lasting joy. And that's why he tells the Philippians earlier in this chapter, he says, 
or, or he goes on here, he says, he will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. This is what he tells them. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, he says, and I do it to safeguard your faith. I do it to safeguard your faith because he knows that counterfeit joys will never ultimately satisfy. From beginning to the end of the Bible, this is what God tells his people, that you can find true joy in me and counterfeit joys, while they will always be a temptation, can never really fulfill you. This is what he says in the Old Testament in Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet. Prophets are the spokesmen for spokesmen and spokeswomen for for God. And and if you know about the Old Testament, you know during this period of history, Israel is the kind of the chosen people of God, and God wants to give them true joy and comfort and peace. And yet they constantly chase after false gods and idols. Constantly, they're always turning. From God, And so God sends prophets to, to warn them and, and tell them, no, come back to me. Come back and enjoy true joy, not counterfeits. And so he speaks to the Israelites through the prophet Jeremiah, and this is what he says. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns. Okay, they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Well, what is this living water, right? The spring of living water that Jeremiah talks about. Well, living water is the Bible's way of saying uh, moving water, spring water, okay? Because it's bubbling up from the ground. It's, it's moving. It's clear. It's clean. It's pure. It's refreshing. And so God is saying, that, that's me. I am living water to you. And I want to give that to you. He says this to the Israelites. He says it to us today. And yet, what do the Israelites do? They go and they dig their own cisterns. Now, if you're wondering, what in the world is a cistern? Think of this as kind of like a pit or a hole. You dig this in the ground. Uh, You can have a cistern that's made from clay pots as well, but you can also dig this in the ground. And you let this fill up with rainwater. And that takes some time, and it sits there, and it stagnates, and it gets dirty, and it's often muddy. And this is what God says the Israelites are doing. You're rejecting living water for dirty, stagnant cistern water. And he even goes on and says, they're not even very good cisterns, right? They're broken, and they leak. And so what God is trying to tell the Israelites and us through the prophet Jeremiah is that we have an opportunity to choose true and lasting joy. We don't need to drink dirty cistern water because it will never ultimately satisfy us. So a major source of discontentment in our lives is idolatry. It's choosing counterfeit joys, thinking that people or possessions will bring us ultimate joy when in fact it is God alone. Now this is a matter of priority. This is a matter of priority, and I think that's really important. Jesus kind of explains this in his Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount is this kind of long sermon that Jesus preaches, and it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew. And so What Jesus says is this is a matter of priority. Look what he says here in the Sermon of the Mount. No one can serve two masters. No one can have two gods, is what Jesus says, right? Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, it's not just money. He uses money as the example here. That's because this is the idea of somebody who's trying to put money up above God as their God, as their counterfeit joy, as their broken cistern. But you could include many other things. You cannot serve both God and this other counterfeit joy. Jesus goes on later in the Sermon on the Mount to talk about this very thing. He says, so do not worry 
saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. So what is Jesus saying? He's saying, seek first the kingdom of God. If you seek God as the source of living water, as the ultimate source of joy and comfort and peace and strength in your life, then other areas of your life once they get lined up with that priority, actually then can become sources of joy and happiness. We serve a good God who wants us to enjoy happiness and peace and comfort. But it has to be lined up underneath him. It is a matter of priority. So let me tell you, if, if you are elevating your marriage up here, thinking that is going to be your ultimate source of intimacy and love, you're going to get disappointed. Because that has become your God. That has become your broken cistern. But I will say this. If you elevate God up as the ultimate source of love and intimacy, and then your marriage gets lined up under that, your marriage will experience more happiness and more joy and more love and more intimacy. It is a matter of priority. Or you think about, about your job. If you think of your job as your ultimate source of uh, comfort, as your ultimate source of security and purpose, you're going to lift that up and it is going to become a disappointment and a discontent. It becomes your God. It becomes your broken cistern. But guess what? You lift God up. He's your source ultimately of comfort, okay, of security, of purpose. Then your job gets to come under that and you find purpose in your job. And it does provide security to you and your family. Again, it is a matter of priority. It is a matter of priority. And so we're so thankful for a God who allows us to enjoy the good things of life. But we have to make sure that they're not counterfeit joys. They're not counterfeit joys. Let's look at another source of discontent in our lives. Another source of discontent in our lives is covetousness. That's a big word. That's like a $20 word, right? <laughs> covetousness. Well, covetousness actually, uh, it comes from the Ten Commandments. That's right, the Big Ten. The Big Ten, okay? Uh, there God comes down at, at Mount Sinai, gives the Ten Commandments, and it says this, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or his male or female servant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Covetousness is the desire to have the thing that someone else has or the person that someone else has. In the scriptures, we actually see that it's, it's very close to uh, envy and jealousy. It's very close to envy and jealousy. You know, it says, oh, look at that guy's new car. I work two jobs and I can barely afford the payments on my piece of junk. He doesn't even work that hard. I know that guy. He doesn't deserve that car. I deserve that car. If I had that car, that car would make me happy. Or it says, you know, look at her husband. He listens to her. He opens the door for her. He's aged pretty well. You know, look at my marriage. This joke of a marriage. I mean, he doesn't even notice I'm in the room half the time. She doesn't deserve that husband. She doesn't know how good she's got it. I deserve that husband. And covetousness. Covetousness. I think uh, covetousness is, uh, is me after I watch too much HGTV. Um, I love HGTV. I don't know, at home and garden television, anybody? Yeah. So I love fixer-upper shows. I love house hunter shows, right? But I, I, I will say, if I sit and watch too long, I feel my contentment level going down and my covetous level going up, right? You know, I go into my shower and I think, I don't have a Caribbean rainfall shower, <laughs> right? My shower just squirts water. That's all it does, you know? Or I don't have a, a TV that covers my whole wall. I only have this, like, 40-incher. I need that whole wall TV. I could watch more HGTV with that wall, yeah. you know, and maybe become more discontent. 
So, I, you know, it's, it may, it's probably not HGTV for you, but, uh, but it may be, right? Maybe for some of you, it is Instagram, right? Look at her clothes. Her clothes are so much nicer than mine. Or maybe it's Facebook. Look at my old high school friends. They seem to be doing so much better than I'm doing. Or maybe it's just walking the halls of your high school or walking, you know, across campus at your university and you see that cute couple and you're single and you think, mm, you know, I want that. That's what I want. Now, let me pause here to say that desire is not a bad thing, okay? Desire in and, its, in and of itself is not a bad thing. It is not wrong to desire marriage if you are single. It is not wrong to desire a better job than the one that you have now. It's not wrong, okay? It's not wrong to want a car that could actually reliably get you from home to work, okay? There's nothing wrong with desire. In fact, the Bible encourages us to plan and to work hard and to desire things. It's not, that's not the problem. The problem is that the Bible does say we easily slip away from good desire into covetousness and into counterfeit joys. And so that's where we need to be careful. You know, Paul, not in the book of Philippians, but in the book of Romans, commands Christians to do this. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Covetousness inverts those. What covetous, covetousness does to us is it makes us rejoice when other people weep. And it makes us weep when other people rejoice. That's what covetousness does to our heart, right? It's you going into work and that guy you don't like gets the promotion and he's happy and he's rejoicing and in your side, inside you're weeping. Or it's, you know, you come into work and, you know, that girl that you work with that you really don't like, she comes in, you can tell she's been crying because she's got the red eyes and the puffy face and you find out her boyfriend's broken up with her and you catch yourself inside a little bit. You're like rejoicing, because you think, ah, oh, she's getting what's finally coming to her. This is what covetous, covetousness does. It's what covetousness does to us. And it destroys our contentment. It destroys our contentment. And Paul knows this. Paul knows that covetousness will steal your joy. And this is why he commands the Philippians in this book. Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete, he says, by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of mind, he says. One of spirit and of mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interest of the others. Covetousness will steal our joy. So how do, we, how do we choose joy then? Again, one of our values here at the Vineyard is to choose joy. We've identified sources of discontent, primarily covetousness and counterfeits or counterfeit joys. So I want to just spend a little bit of my remaining time with you to talk about what are some ways that we can choose joy. And this is the next one on your outline. One of the primary, the most important way to choose joy is to consider Christ as your greatest treasure. This is what Paul did. Paul says this is one of the keys to Christian contentment, that he had learned to consider Christ as his greatest treasure. You know, in the book of Philippians, uh, Paul talks about all of these accomplishments that he had before becoming a Christian. And I was just so thankful for Pastor Parker's um, message last week, but also for thankfully setting me up for this one as well, because he kind of talked about Paul's radical conversion and how he left all that behind. Well, we're really actually looking at the end of Paul's ministry now. Um, and so he says, I had all of these things before coming to Christ, right? I was well-known. I was well-educated. I was well-thought of. I was well-fed. He was probably well-paid or well-compensated uh, as, uh, as kind of a religious elite. He had all this before coming to Christ, but what does he tell the Philippians about this? But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. 
What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And then he gets really strong with this language. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him. I consider them garbage, he says. Now, I'm not saying that you should look at all the good things in your life and say they're garbage. So don't go home and, and you know, say to your wife or your husband or your kids, you're garbage. I'm just applying, I'm applying the sermon from tonight. Okay, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what Paul is saying. What Paul is saying is that all of those things that I had before I became a Christian, those were my counterfeit joys. Those were my broken cisterns. That's where I tried to find my identity and my purpose and all of that. And he says, but Christ, I realize now, is my greatest treasure. And compared to that, it's garbage. It's garbage, he says. And so we have to consider Christ as our greatest treasure. And I will say this, okay? And this is not because I've perfected this. Okay? It's not that I've learned the secret of Christian contentment. I'm learning it. But it's almost hard to be discontent if you can go through your day knowing that Christ is your greatest treasure. It's almost hard to be discontent. One, of, um, one way that we can think about this, or one way that we can help choose joy and see Christ as our greatest treasure is the Bible, is reading the Bible. Um, the well-known theologian uh, John Calvin, he's a French theologian, he famously compared the Bible to eyeglasses. Okay, famous, com you know, compared to glasses, right? And he said, you know, when you put on the Bible, you see the world completely, you completely differently. Well, I'll, I'll update John Calvin's analogy here, um, and we'll talk about contacts. Um, I wear contacts. I put them in in the morning so I can see. I can see all your beautiful faces. And, um, but I have a friend who wears contacts, but he wears them while he sleeps. Stay with me because you're kind of thinking this doesn't really help, your eyes are closed. But he actually has, he has contacts that actually, they, they reshape his eyes while he, while he sleeps, right? They kind of mold his eyes. So when he gets up in the morning, he takes those contacts out, and he actually has 20-20, actually better than 20-20 vision. And he goes throughout his day, and he can see. And, uh, but as the day gets late, as he gets into the evening, his eyes begin to regress, back to the original shape. And he, he has a hard time seeing so much that before, you know, before bed, if he's watching TV, he's actually got to put on, on eyeglasses. But then when he goes to sleep, he pops the contacts back in, and magically, uh, the next day, it's not magic, it's science, but it seems like magic to me. Okay, he wakes up the next day, and, and he can see again. You know, the Bible's a little bit like that when it comes to contentment and discontentment, is that we read the scriptures, we read the Bible, and we see how glorious God is, how great God is, how powerful God is, that he loves us and that he gives us peace and that he's chosen us as his children and that it will be with him for eternity. And the list can go on and on, right? And your contentment level just kind of goes up and it's as if your eyes have been reshaped to see the world the way that God wants you to see the world. You start to see Christ as your treasure. And so, Work doesn't seem so hard with that guy who sits in the next cubicle who's really annoying. Or, you know, that's not anybody personal. I don't know anybody personally. You're thinking, oh, who's he talking about? Okay, or, you know, or when your children are ungrateful, which happens a lot, okay? Because Christ is your greatest treasure. But just like those eyes that with time regress back to their weakness, that's kind of what happens to us, right? And so we go to work and we have to deal with that other guy in the other cubicle or you check Instagram and you see something on there that makes you feel a little bit covetous or, you know, you look at Facebook or, you know, you have to deal with an ungrateful husband, and ungrateful kids and, you know, you're in the grocery store and the grocery store aisle and you have to look at magazines of airbrushed men and women who seem to have glamorous lives, much more glamorous than yours and, you go home and you want to relax with some Netflix and you watch a show of people who seem so much more interesting than you and they have such great lives and, and we begin to lose that clear vision of the world, right? It begins to wear off and that's why we have to go back into the Bible, reshape those eyes so that we can understand that Christ is our greatest treasure. Let me pause here to also say that small groups are 
really, really helpful with this, right? During the week, meeting with other people, that when you meet with other Christians and you begin to raise up Christ, either through prayer or fellowship or studying the word, you begin to think, you know, man, I've had a rough week, but you know, Christ is my greatest treasure. And your contentment level goes up and you're able to choose joy. So consider Christ your greatest treasure. We also need to count our blessings. We need to count our blessings. You can see here in Philippians that Paul uh, encourages the Christians to rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Present your request to God. So what does he say? He says, with thanksgiving. Come to the Lord with thanksgiving. Count your blessings. We not only need to look at God in his word, but we need to be thankful and look at God's world, what's going on around us. Christ is our greatest treasure. It is our greatest blessing. But there are many other blessings in our lives that we find in family and in friends and in a sunset and birds singing and the very fact that we have breath in our lungs and also the fact that we have a wonderful church family to belong to. Count your blessings. It is a key to contentment. But what we also see here is that, and we'll get there in just a second, that we're also encouraged by Paul to cry out to God. To cry out to God. Count your blessings and cry out to God. And these seem like such a strange juxtaposition. But we serve a good, a good God who wants us to do both. Let's go back to this passage really quick, okay? What we see is we come with thanksgiving, but we also come by prayer and petition. We cry out to God. This is one of the ironies of Christian contentment is that we're not supposed to fake like we don't have discontentment. No, we're supposed to bring those to God. He wants to hear them, to cry out to God, God, I'm having a horrible, horrible day. I have a lot of counterfeit joys right now. Help me to see you as my greatest treasure. Or God, I don't understand this tragedy or this disappointment. I don't get it, and I'm so desperate and unhappy. Lord, help me. This is the irony, is that God wants us to bring that to him. You can't hide it from God anyways. You might be able to hide that from other people. You cannot hide it from God behind a fake smile. So you might as well bring it to him. He wants to hear it. He wants you to count your blessings, and he wants you to cry out to him. You know, there is um, a prayer acronym uh, that... Um, that many Christians have been really praying for several hundred years, maybe longer, we're not exactly sure, but we, we definitely know for a couple hundred years. And um, it's largely based on the Lord's Prayer. That's the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. And so for some of you who are like, I just I have a hard time praying, I, I need direction in prayer, um, I think that you might find this Acts prayer helpful. And, and you actually find this at the end of your outline, by the way, if you're wondering, where did this, this Acts come from? The first is adoration. And so you come to God and you begin to tell God how awesome he is, right? This helps us to count Christ as our greatest treasure, is to come and tell God, you are wonderful, you are good to me, thank you. The C is that we go into a time of confession. Lord, I'm struggling. I struggle with counterfeit joys. I'm struggling with happiness. I'm, tr I'm struggling to choose joy. Help me, Lord. We go into a time of thanksgiving. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for my family. Thank you for my church. Thank you for my children. Thank you for the work that I have so I can put food on my table. And then finally, supplication. It's a fancy word to just come to God and ask for your needs. To say, Lord, I need this. Help me with this. And help those around me with this. So, this might be helpful to you, for those of you who maybe struggle in prayer. This can be done, you just, you just basically start with A, and you move through it. And maybe you only have like a five-minute drive. I've got a five-minute drive to work, and you know, then this is a perfect prayer for you. Take the first minute, and adore God, and then confess, and then give thanksgiving, and then, and then give supplication. But you'll notice that in supplication, 
don't just pray for yourself, but pray for others. Because Paul also knows, and this is our last point on the outline, that caring for others is key to Christian contentment. Caring for others is key to Christian contentment. And here at Vineyard Community Church, there are many ways for you to serve. And, you know, um, honestly, choosing joy is also choosing to serve. Really, it is. Choosing to serve is a way to Christian contentment. And, you know, one of the, the, the first steps to serving is our growth track, going through growth track. Those are the first steps, and we actually have step four tonight. Now, step four is the only one that you can't do out of order. So if you've done one, two, and three, really encourage you to go to growth track step four. Now, if you've not completed all of them, we're going to start again next week with step one. It's a great place to start, one. Okay, so if you've not started, next week is your week to start in growth track. But you know, it's amazing to me that in this whole book that's all about joy and all about rejoicing, that Paul highlights four people. He mentions a few others, but he really highlights four people. And you know, the four, what he says about those four people is that they all serve others, that they all care. Let's look at them just really briefly. First of all, Timothy. He mentions Timothy. Timothy was uh, someone who Paul had mentored. He was a young pastor. And what does Paul say about Timothy? I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare for everyone looks out for their own interest and not those of Christ Jesus. But Timothy was different. But Timothy was different. He also mentions Epaphrodites, one of those good long Greek names. Epaphrodites. Epaphrodites had actually, he was a, a member of the congregation in Philippi. He's the one who brought all that food and clothing to Paul in prison. And he'd gotten very sick and he almost died. But God was merciful, Paul said, and Epaphrodites, he, he got well. And Paul was sending him back with this letter. And what does Paul say? So then welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honor people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. Epaphrodites served. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give me. Meaning all the Philippian church couldn't come visit him. So Epaphrodites was the representative. Paul highlights himself. He's stuck in prison. He might be executed at any moment. And this is what he tells the Philippians. I desire to depart and be with Christ. He says, I've, I've done a lot of stuff and it would be, and prison's not so fun. It'd actually be great to be with Christ right now. He says, which is better by far, but is more necessary for you, he says, that I remain in the body. He says, I'll stick around for your sake to serve you. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. And then finally, right in the middle of this letter, the greatest example of all, Jesus. Rather in humility, Paul says, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of the others. He points us to Christ. He points us to Christ as not only our great example, but he points to Christ as our greatest treasure, as our greatest treasure. And I'll be very blunt. If you do not know Jesus Christ, you do not know the lasting source of all joy in this world. And many of you have been drinking out of broken, dirty cisterns your whole life. You've been looking for joy. You've been looking for comfort. You've been looking for peace. And you've been looking in places that can never satisfy you. But the Lord can. The Lord can give you living water. So I do, I want to transition into a time of prayer. And when I do that, if you, have, if you have never come to Christ as your source of living water, I want to pray with you tonight. I want you to choose joy by choosing Christ. That is what I want with you, for you. And so as I pray, I'll lead you in that prayer and then we'll, we'll transition. So why don't you bow your head with me? So if, you've, if you want to choose joy, if you have been drinking from that broken cistern tonight and you want that living water that God promises, I want you to pray with me. You can just pray with me right where you're at, silently. Father God, you say that you are true and lasting joy. And I want that because I have been chasing after counterfeits my whole life. 
and I want the real thing. And so tonight, I choose joy by choosing you. I follow you. Become the Lord and Savior of my life. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and lead me. In Jesus' name, amen.